Hi, Lina. Hello. I don't know why, but for this lecture, I feel nervous. <laughs> and it's the same lecture that I did. <laughs> oh, don't be. Uh, the premaster students are very supportive and active, so hope it's going to be fine. Cool. <laughs>
Laura? Yes. Uh, I think that I have a message in the chat that people are trying to come in, but they uh -huh. can't. Uh, ah, yes. Someone in the waiting. Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, I, the, the I host. Can... Uh, you can make me the host, then I will add everyone. Uh, no, I can start adding. Uh, okay. So if you need to uh, admit all. Okay, hello everyone. Um,
happy to welcome you at our uh, lecture, What is BioArt? And uh, let me introduce the speaker. Uh, so today we have here Laura Rodriguez, an independent artist and biotechnologist who explores aesthetics, empathy for all species and care systems for biological networks. Uh, Laura is also, also curator uh, of the art and science major called BioArt, Biomedia and the New Nature. And she's also the graduate of the program, one of the first graduates of the program. So if you have any uh, questions about your studies at the program, um, the experience Laura had, or anything related to BioArt, uh, just shoot and <laughs> Laura will uh, answer them all. Uh, okay, uh, Laura, I give the floor to you. Thank you, Nina. Thank you very much. I'm also very happy to be here uh, to meet all of you and have this talk about bioart. As Lina mentioned, well, uh, it's my focus of research and artistic practice, so I'm very fascinated to talk about it. So let me start by sharing my screen. And we will start this small talk. So can everyone see my screen? Yes. Thank you. Um, during the talk, please write questions in the chat. I will try to, to monitor uh, if there is any question and don't be afraid. I love when people interrupt me and then I can explain more about the artwork or if they have any questions or comments. Um, so my purpose today is to talk about bioart. That is one of the most modern formulation of one of the oldest relationships, art and nature. Uh, a little bit of my background. Uh, I came from Mexico. I studied in biotechnology engineering, but for me, there was always the spark of doing art. Maybe I grew up in an environment that didn't push me in that direction, but later um, by this inner desire was like, okay, I want to know more about contemporary art. Then I had the opportunity to meet a curator of bio art in Moscow. And this possibility opened up when the masters of art and science uh, was for first time offered in ITMO. And I think that has been one of the best decisions of my life. Uh, my life changed completely uh, uh, in the question of how happy I am doing what I do. Uh, however, I still find connections between a scientist and artist. I think both of them are driven by the curiosity, curiosity of how everything works, how are we connected? How can I improve this? How can I give knowledge to people? So although my activities change, I think that my philosophy of life just kept growing. So uh, nowadays, I, when people ask me what I am or what I do, well, I say that I'm a bio artist sometimes. And most of the people haven't heard about what it is or it they have heard it's not clear what is bio art or what a bio artist do. And they mostly ask me if I paint with bacteria, uh, something like this, they imagine. However, I have never done something uh, like painting with bacteria yet, uh, but I wanted to show this image that is very popular to confuse a craft with biotechnologies, a craft art or sorry, a craft object with a artistic object. In this case, you have see, you see here five Petri dishes, these circles, that they have some bacteria that, and the colors and the distribution of the bacteria resemble the starry night of Van Gogh. Uh, however, this project is considered as a craft using microbiology, microorganisms. It uh, resembles of another artwork. So uh, without going too deep in what 
what makes an artwork. Well, if you would like, we can discuss later what is art and what is not. I want to make still a distinction that bio art or pieces of art in bio art are not just using living microorganisms, but the idea behind, and that was marked by the contemporary art movement in the last century. Please do not misunderstand me. I think that to do a beautiful picture with bacteria requires some talent. And it's not as easy as, as you might think. Probably if we try to do something uh, right now, it will look more like this. So it requires still skills, but not everything having something alive is considered bio art. So bio art uh, is part of the movement of contemporary art called art and science. Uh, well, in science, we have the scientific method and the scientists are creating hypotheses of how something can work, then they make experiments and confirm or disprove the hypothesis. But artists working with science are making fabulations. And then after the experiments, they create something. They are not confirming or disproving anything. Whatever is the result is a creation. And in general, art and science is about making alliance. Alliance between the artists and scientists, alliance between the objects of study that can be robots or artificial intelligence. And in the case of bio art, something alive. And, and then these other entities become the protagonists of the art and science. And in bio art, we are talking about living systems and why bio art is now so popular or why it's emerging in this moment as a modern term. Well, because last century we have the biotechnological revolution. In the beginning of the century, we have Fleming that discovered the penicillin, an antibiotic, and that changed the life of humans forever. Then in the 70s, we have the discovery of the DNA. And then we start to understand how humans and every living system work. Then in the 2000s, then we understood that DNA has some genes and the genes uh, express some proteins that make the humans. And we understood what uh, is the action of all of the genes of humans. So all this knowledge start to be more available. The technology is a little bit less expensive. They are still very expensive, but uh, the technologies and knowledge was available for society. And art is always uh, reactive to what is happening in society. If there is a revolution, probably you will see uh, artworks from that time that talk about war and what is happening. So art is a fragile entity that now is reacting to the biotechnological revolution. So bio art is a transformation of, of the scientific tools into art, is an artistic manifestation. Okay, just a little bit intro about biology. This is the paper that gave the Nobel Prize to Watson and Crick uh, about the model of the DNA. So all of us, are made of millions of cells. Uh, we're ma uh, made of other stuff, but I will arrive there a little bit later. Uh, in all these cells, we have the DNA. And the first image that we have, that is the first selfie of the DNA is this one. It's called P51, the picture 51. And it's an image of crystallography that was taken by Rosalind Franklin. Franklin was a scientist in the 70s. And without her collaboration, the structure of the DNA couldn't be discovered at, at the moment. However, she was not awarded with the Nobel Prize. There, there is a lot of theories of why she was not awarded with it. But the fact is that in the 70s, uh, women in science were still a minority. For example, uh, in the coffee break room where the scientists were taking their coffee and cookies, women were not allowed. So Rosalind Franklin had to develop a very strong personality in order to make their way into science in the 70s. 
Uh, and she had a collaborator, a male collaborator called Wilkins. And Wilkins was making the collaboration with other scientists and institutions. And in one of these meetings, uh, Wilkins showed to Crick and Watson the image of the work from Franklin. And when Crick and Watson saw the image, they realized that this was the structure, the last piece uh, to solve the puzzle of how was the structure of the DNA. Later, the work of Rosalind Franklin has been um, recognized. However, uh, there is no Nobel Prize post-mortem, so it was not possible that she was awarded with the same recognition. So, considering that the discovering of DNA was the impulsor, was the um, boost for bioart, now we need to describe a little bit of what, what is bioart. It will be um, illogical for me to tell you just one single con concept of what is bioart, but I like to share with you one concept that was created by a scientist, Church. Uh, George Church works in Harvard and he's a synthetic biologist. And an artist, Joe Davis, that he works next to Church in Harvard. And they say that bio art is part of contemporary art, as I say, uh, but it adapts the scientific methods or tools of biotechnology to explore living systems as an artistic subjects. This little word here, subjects, is changing everything about the art with bacteria or with other living organisms. Because we, or as a scientist, sometimes we tend to see the bacteria that we're working with just as, a, as an object, uh, as a tool. But a, a subject uh, recognizing a living system, a dog, a plant, as a subject, it gives some attributes of uh, they are usually just given to humans, like all this process of growing, uh, decision making, uh, even personhood. So bioart has the characteristic to erase boundaries or limits between art and modern biology. And the most common topics that bioart is using in, as a statements are philosophical, societal, or environmental issues. Well, I told you what some people describe as bioart, but there is also other great curators and philosophers like Jane Hauser, James Hauser, sorry. She, for example, says that there is no bioart or there is only bioart. Uh, why he make this statement? Well, bio means life. And art is something that is all that always involves an observer, a human, usually. And in this case, it is alive. So the observer is also making meaning of the art. When you go and see a sculpture with your friends, maybe for you, the sculpture say something beautiful for you other friends say something disgusting and for the other didn't say anything so the whole construction of what art is also depends on the observer that is alive so he say for example there is no bio art or everything is bio art because it involves a human or living process <laughs> then we also have uh, that bio art is the most common name for this type of art that used living systems, but it was not always like that. In the 90s, when the movement started to grow, a lot of people call it transgenic art, living art. Nowadays, uh, in the most important festival of art and science, Arts Electronica, there is no bio art category. It's called hybrid art. And just last year, I heard for the first time the term pan bio art, uh, that is basically the same movement of bio art, but based in Eastern philosophies. Uh, and it forms as a movement that contrasts the Western bio art. Like bio art has the boom in, in the Western world. And then pan bio art is trying to uh, contrast some of the capitalistic or approaches that bio art had when it born in the West world. So, uh, that's why I told you that I cannot tell you a single uh, this concept of bio art. And I'm not sure if I, in the end of the presentation, you will understand more what is bio art 
or you, you will have more questions. I really hope you will have more questions and I will uh, drive you to make some research. I think this is the work now of a lot of curators, uh, historians, historians of art, and it's really nice when we can take part of the history that, that we are writing. Um, so to make some distinctions uh, in the tendencies of what people call bio art, um, I would like to start with something that is called biothematic, that is not bio art itself. It's when you use, or the artists use, the classical art techniques like painting or sculpture to talk about some biotechnological processes. For example, Alexis Druckmann, uh, he, we, here we have the painting of the farm. In this painting, you see uh, the pig that is uh, culturing different organs for human transplants or the square cow. So he's talking about um, this fantasy world uh, that has been changed completely by the biotechnolo biotechnology that we're developing. In that case, biothematic can also include some of the artworks of Dali. Dali was super inspired by the discovery of DNA. He said that for him, the discovery of DNA, it was the proof that there was a stronger force, contrary of what scientists were trying to, to express. Uh, uh, for Dali, it was a proof of God. Uh, so he was very inspired and created different artworks inspired by the the DNA, in this case, he combined the name of her partner, his partner Gala, her partner, sorry, <laughs> uh, his partner Gala and the name of the DNA, that is the succinyl acid. Uh, so this, art, this type of art has a bio thematic. But then to be considered bio art, we need to have a bio media the biomediality, there is a living system or living um, organism. The very first uh, archive that we have of images painting with bacteria uh, are made by Fleming. I told you that he discovered the penicillin. So he was a very creative scientist. Um, the story say that he also was very messy. So he had a lot of bacteria and some food uh, uh, that his wife gave to him. And he forgot about it in the work table. And then the orange that he was supposed to eat started to grow a fungus. And then he noticed that the fungus, uh, when it grows, the bacteria around didn't grow. And that's how he discovered the penicillin that is created by the penicillium uh, fungi. And then he noticed also different colors. So he created these this little portraits using the pigments of bacteria. This is not considered as part of contemporary art because uh, there is no connection of narrative. There is not a concept. However, the first images that we have of painting with bacteria, the first organism that was exhibited in a museum was this plants called delphiniums. Edward Station, he was working in the MoMA. Nowadays, everyone knows the MoMA as a great institution. In that moment, it only has seven years of open. And Edward Station was working there as a photographer. And there was one week where nothing was in this space in the gallery. So he said he asked permission to bring some of the plants that he was artificially breeding in order to express some specific characteristics like how tall they were, the colors. So he was breeding for the sake of aesthetic. And that was the first organism that was presented in a gallery as an artwork itself. So we're talking about almost 90 years ago. So bio art itself is not as new as uh, a lot of people believe. And in bioart, it's not only the living system, but also we can use the data, the data from living systems. We have here the artwork of Heather Dewey that is called Strangers 
stranger visions. So basically what she did, she was making portraits of people that she never met. Uh, how she did this? Well, uh, the inspiration came from one session she was in the therapist and meanwhile, she was waiting for the doctor. She realized that in the sofa, there was a little hair uh, of another patient that was there before her. So she started playing with the hair and imagining the story of who was this person. It was a male, it was a female, what kind of problems she was telling about. Is she okay? Will she come back? And then, she realized that she had in her hand the DNA of another person. And maybe she could investigate who was this person. So what she did, uh, she took the different trash from the street, for example, the bonds of some cigarettes, where is DNA of other persons, strangers. And she isolated the DNA from these samples, then sent this DNA to sequencing, that it means to extract the data, uh, what, what are the genes in this DNA, and compared to a database in order to see what are the genes of this DNA, how, how this DNA is expressed in proteins, and that can give you an idea of how the person can look like. Of course, it's not completely accurate. Uh, it's a lot of assumptions because the DNA DNA, uh, in contrary of what we thought last century, is not the final instruction of who you are. Nowadays, we know that the DNA is approximately just 10%. So it doesn't matter what your DNA says, a lot of who you are, how you look like, and the disease that you might have, depends 20% of your uh, environment, the external factors, and 70% of your habits. So although you have the DNA of someone, it's probably unlikely that you will really understand how this person looks like, but it can have some resembles to the origin, the original owner of this DNA. So can you imagine maybe someday you enter to the gallery and see someone that looks similar to you because Heather was walking outside your street. Well, this is one of the artworks that Heather is uh, presenting with a subject of the value of DNA and the surveillance of DNA. So nowadays we have heard these stories or we have seen also movies, how political systems or countries could control the individuals by identifying by DNA, like your credit card could be connected to your DNA or something like this. Uh, so she's also talking about the possibilities or the dangers about these kind of measures of linking everything to the DNA. So uh, in general, bio art is about the medium that you're using. If you want to talk about um, some living organism, it's important what matters are you using, what materials are you using? So it's not only use bacteria or plants because we can use them for the artwork, but what is the relationship between what you want to say as an artist and what materials are you using? This also came uh, very accurate or very, it makes a good match with what McLuhan says, like the medium is the meshes. So the medium itself that you are using is already giving an impact to the viewer and it already translates some meshes to the person that is watching the artwork. Therefore, in bio art is not only the medium the meshes, but the growth of the medium is the meshes. So I'm gonna give a very short uh, intro of bio because I'm gonna talk about Sometimes uh, I will say like the artist took a gene or the artist modified the DNA. And I just want that everyone have a little background of what, I'm, uh, what biology is uh, to understand how incredible these art pieces uh, are being created. 
So in your cell, you have this DNA molecule. It is a double helix. So there are two strands and they are connected like this helix. And these strands are connected by nitrogen bases, timine, cytosine, adenine, and guanine. Uh, timine binds with adenine, with the red with the yellow. Cytosine binds with guanine, the blue with the green. Then, here you have all the instructions to make who you are or any living organism have the instructions to make who you are. But how that happen? There are parts like, let's imagine from here to the middle, that this is instruction to make a protein. Uh, let's imagine that there is only one protein that gives the color of your eyes. So this protein will determine the color of your eyes. So this part is one gene. One gene gives one protein. In order to create proteins, the DNA should be translated into RNA. It means, imagine that the instructions are in English and you need to translate it into Spanish because uh, the cell only understands the Spanish. So you take the DNA, translate it into RNA. And then the RNA will be translated into proteins. There will come a lot of amino acids that are the little parts that make the protein will create a change and then the change will bind and make together with other proteins. And you will have the functional protein that gives the color of your eyes blue, for example. So then the main thing, we have DNA that is translated into RNA, and then the RNA makes a protein. And the protein makes everything. A lot of proteins together will make the tissue of your heart. Then another, another amount of proteins together will make the skeleton, not skeleton, the veins of your circular system. And then the whole organism is made of different systems. And then the organism have communities. And then the communities live in an ecosystem. And then this ecosystem makes the earth. And the earth is in the universe. So basically, when we're talking about bio art, we're talking about the systems of life that goes from the DNA uh, to the whole universe. So this is a huge, huge field for creating artworks. So I will try just to give you a, a few examples, trying to go from the minimum part to the biggest part. Okay, so in the 80s, we have one of the first transgenic artworks. When Joe Davis, the, now he's working in Harvard, he decided to put uh, this image that is an ancient German rune that represents the femininity, the female earth or fertility. Decided to translate it into binary code from the computers that are ones and zeros. So you can see here like the resembles of the image in the ones tool. He created a pictographic study uh, into binary code. And then he translate this into DNA. How he did it? So the number one could be an adenine or a timine or a cytosine. And then the zero is another nitrogen basis. And then he created a syn synthetic fragment of DNA. And then he put it in a bacteria. It's possible to put DNA inside bacteria and other cells and send them to the space. You might wondering why he sent it to the space. So why not? That's really cool. But the main idea was to make an answer to one scientific project made a few years before. This is a pioneer table that was sent to the space in the pioneer spacecraft from the NASA. 
And with collaboration of Carl Sagan, they sent this uh, table in the spacecraft to the space in case that the spacecraft finds some intelligent life or intelligent organism. So this intelligent alien will understand who we are from where this spacecraft comes. So here is a solar system and it's like, here's the Earth. So it's like, oh, we come from here. Uh, the machine is this big and we look like this. There is male and female in this planet and we created this spacecraft. So I think it was a really cool idea, but Joe Davis noticed that the female, the, sorry, the male genitalia was quite cool representative, representative, let's say, but the female genitalia was not fully represented. So Joe Davis decided to make an answer to this scientific project and sent later the part that they forgot to put in the pioneer table. So this is the genitalia of the woman that she'll be drawing here. So it was like a delayed message uh, to the space. So it was complementarily to this scientific project. And this was one of the first synthetic DNAs put in the space as an artwork. Then in the 91, we have Eduardo Katz with his project Genesis. Genesis, um, it looks like that. Here, here it was a Petri dish, that is this circular container where bacteria was living. And this is the microscopic vision from the Petri dish, like just make it bigger. So you can see these dots, that's how colonies of thousands of bacteria look like. And these colonies are glowing because they uh, insert a DNA that creates a protein that fluoresce. So they are glowing. In the beginning, there are some glowing blue, some glowing green, and some glowing yellow. Uh, but that was not the important part, uh, or not the most important part in this artwork. This is the DNA sequence uh, that they inserted in the bacteria that did nothing but had information. So it didn't alter the bacteria, but it had some information. What information has? Well, it had the first paragraph of the biblical text of the Genesis, that's why the artwork is called Genesis, that um, makes allusion of, uh, or talks about the creation of the world, the world that we know. So they translate the alphabetic uh, symbols, the alphabet into Morse code. There is this one with dots and lines and then translate that into DNA. Again, like this dot can represent cytosine, the line represents uh, timine and so on. So this text was uh, transformed into a synthetic DNA. They inserted it in a bacteria, uh, but the bacteria, initial bacteria, had a blue gene and a yellow gene that uh, make the fluorescence of the bacteria. But the bacteria reproduce by several generations and also interact with other bacteria. And the bacteria have the ability to share information DNA in, uh, between each other. So some bacteria share information to another bacteria, giving the yellow gene and the blue gene. So when you combine blue and yellow, you will have green. So these create mutations. When every time a cell is reproducing, there is a mutation. There are systems to modify and correct the mutations. For example, right now, all of us have some mutations and mostly of all, all of us has some cancer cells, some cell that is reproducing in a wrong way. However, we have, most of us have a good immune system and this immune system will go there 
and kill this uh, cell that has a lot of mutations and wouldn't be good for us. So what uh, Eduardo Katz did, Katz did is after several generations and mutations, took back the DNA, translated back into code mores and from code mores into the alphabet and see some mutations. For example, instead of men, let men have the mind over the fish. It says, let Alan have the mind over the fish of the sea. And there are some other mutations in the end. So what is the most important about this artwork is that the protagonist of the piece is an artistic gene. Eduardo gives the credit of the piece for this artistic gene that has the ability to evolve and to change. This artwork is talking about uh, religious philosophies, about how society looks into religion and science at the same time, the controversy between them. And the, the thing that came, that changed the perspective of art, it was to give agency to a bacteria to be collaborator of the artist to create a project. Okay, so we talk about DNA and some bacteria. Let's go to tissues. So when you combine different type of cells, you can have a tissue, for example, your skin have three layers. Um, and humans use skins of other animals to create some products like leather. So or on cats, that is also a pioneer in the art in the field of bioart, uh, create in 2004, the artwork called Bikinless Leather. So uh, what do you see here? Can you write in the chat? What does this image look like? So, well, it looks like a dress or like a jacket. Uh, it, is, it looks like a coat and it is supposed to be a jacket. This jacket is made of skin, uh, of tissue from different cells. Uh, it is grown into a scalpel or a structure of bone. And then the scientists sit some cells from the skin of a pig and grow the shape of the, um, the coat of the cloth. So it, calls, it is called victim, victimless leather because we are create or they created a piece of clothing without killing any animal. So this artwork is talking about the ethics of using other animals for human benefit. The artwork itself is outstanding uh, and something that I don't know if it was in the mind of the artists when they did it, but become um, like a legend about this artwork is that it was still growing during the exhibition. So inside the capsule, well, there is oxygen and media nutrients that the cells need to keep alive. So these layers of cells from the skin continue growing during the exhibition. So the shape changed a little bit. Uh, it start, the, the observer will see how it was different from the first day to the 15th day of the exhibition. So it was alive. And then when the exhibition ended, they were needed to disconnect it. And that will mean that they will kill it. So that create a lot of controversy. How artists, if artists or scientists are allowed to kill uh, something that is alive, and especially, if, I don't know, if, if, in this case it was pig cells, but imagine there are human cells. So uh, scientists actually every day kill bacteria and cells uh, in the laboratory. And nobody has a problem with that, but it totally changed when 
there was a, an artwork in the gallery and society was seeing how it grows and how it needed to be killed. It also brings up topics about abortion, for example, like what is the minimum system to be considered alive and what can we kill and what cannot kill. Orum Katz and Jonas Sur uh, now have the Institute of Symbiotica and they continue doing artworks, especially with tissue culturing and queer biology. So here you can see how the complete artwork looked like and it was connected to receive air, to receive uh, uh, nutrients from other flasks. And well, it confronted people with all the moral implications, not only of wearing dead animals, but also what it means to be alive itself. They can, they have continued uh, working. May I yes? interrupt you about previous work about victims? Yeah, please. Uh, it's interesting yeah. that um, it, it uh, when it uh, ends, it uh, became not victimless because True. artists. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, one more uh, thing. Um, uh, do you hear that? Um, because uh, I came up with that idea on myself, but I didn't get any any approval of that. Uh, it may be um, an interpretation of Bible text. Uh, it, it, in the book Genesis, uh, in the very beginning, it says that the Lord God uh, made germans of skin for Adam and his wife and closed them. And they, uh, it uh, started uh, some discussion about maybe God itself made uh, uh, killed something to make that uh, germans. Uh, to, to, make, uh, to make what? Uh, I mean, in Bible, uh, it Bible, uh -huh. said it says that uh, God uh, created, uh, made, it, it made uh, Germans of skin for Adam uh -huh. and his wife. And uh, um. it started a discussion about maybe God uh, killed something to make uh, that close. Because, sure. because um, be before that work wasn't existed, we do not understand that maybe it's possible to make clothes without killing an animal. Mm -hmm. Right, right you are. It's, it's also an interesting point to consider it. Uh, and also, I think the idea of if the artists have the power, like God, to kill something or to create something, uh, could we create a new organism with tissue culturing? So I, I, I think that, that there is a lot of um, ontological questions in bio art and also about the victimless what we need to analyze what what it makes a victim uh, I'm not sure this had um, some pain because there was no nervous system to feel but um, there are other organisms like plants they don't have a nervous system like animals or like humans but they have a similar system that allow us to perceive. So it's, it's really a good point what you make about uh, that in the end it might not have been victimless because something could have suffered or in the end something was killed. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Any other comments? Please, uh, I'm very happy to hear uh, your opinion. So in any moment, oh, you can open your microphone. Okay, I continue with this other piece also from Orum Katz. Uh, continue with the growing of tissue. He cre created the semi-living worry dolls, almost the same technology, using the scaffolds and growing tissue uh, uh, around it. Something that is interested, uh, interesting. He was collaborating with scientists, but in, uh, in Australia, they patent this way to producing layers and 3D forms of uh, tissue. So now it's some, something also very valuable for industries. So this is also how artists and scientists collaboration is making an impact in the industry world. This 
semi-living worry dolls have the background into the worrying dolls from Guatemalan culture, where uh, you can buy these knitted dolls. Uh, they are made of some fabric and strings. And you buy them, you can whisper to them your sorrows, your concerns. I don't know, you are concerned about an exam that you need to give tomorrow. So you tell to this little doll your, your problems, then you sleep, you put it under your pillow, and the myth says that this little doll will take care of your problems. Um, so these little dolls in the myth, they are kind of alive entities. So he created the real semi-living worry dolls that you could also whisper your concerns and fears, and your worries. Um, so this is an example of how bio art is creating fairy tales uh, into real artworks or transforming the myths into realities. Something that I have found in Russia uh, is something like this, very similar, uh, the little dolls. Uh, but as far as I understood uh, in the Maslinitsa um, festival, these dolls are for a specific purposes. For example, this one was for traveling, but I bought it in the year of the pandemic, so I think now it's not working very good because I haven't gone anywhere. But uh, it's interesting to see how different cultures have these myths about living dolls that do something for humans. Okay, let's go to uh, the last examples of bio art. In 2019, we have Labor, is the artwork of Paul Banus. And the artists make a very simple question. How does exploitation smell? He, he was wondering how this labor is smell like. So he was traveling to uh, some places where people was working basically in slavery conditions, uh, were making a lot of physical effort to bring in some rocks or some minerals outside of the mines. And they were wearing these t-shirts. It was the only clothes that they were using uh, during the hard work they have. And uh, what Paul Panus did he took samples from the skin of these workers uh, and analyzed what bacteria lives in their skin. So in the beginning I, of the lecture, I told you that you are made of millions of human cells, but you are also made of millions of bacteria. Uh, there are hundreds of bacteria now in your finger, hundreds of bacteria in your face, and millions of bacteria in your guts inside your, your body. And you are almost like one to one radio. So you are like half human, half bacteria. And the bacteria are also having their own biochemistry. They are also eating and they are also secreting, uh, expul expulsing some materials. And sometimes these materials have an effect in the human biochemistry. Recently, there is a research that says that the bacteria that lives in your guts inside of you can have some effect in your behavior because there are some molecules that can affect the biochem the metabolism in your brain. So now they are using different types of bacterial communities to treat depression, for example. And if bacteria does this inside our body, of course, is doing a lot outside of body. Every one of us have a different smell. Sometimes you like more the smell of one person. Sometimes you don't like the smell of something. Uh, but this smell is not only about taste and attraction, but it's also about the bacteria that lives on the surface. In your body, there is a lot of bacteria that creates your aroma. And Paul Banus identified the three main bacteria that were present in this community working in condition of slavery and found three strains, Staphylococcus epidermis, Corinobacterium serosis, and Propionobacterium avidum. Then he grow these bacteria that are 
present in the skin, given the, the smell of this man. And extract the smell from each bioreactor where the bacteria was growing. And by tubes, by these holes, was impregnated, impregnating the t-shirt by the aroma of a person that was working under hard conditions, although the t-shirt has never been used. Let's watch a video. I'm not sure if video looks very good in Zoom, but uh, you might see in the center the shirt and then three bioreactors. These containers have liquid nutrients where the bacteria is growing and the holes are extracting the air. These containers are designed especially to make the bacteria grow. It has all of its, its favorite food. And then you can approach to the t-shirt. There was a little hole. You can see the people trying to smell. The hand trying to smell how it's slavery smell like. I think this is a very humanistic and outstanding artwork. It's incredible uh, to be talking about something so human as a slavery uh, through the other participants of, of the human body, like bacteria that exist all around us. I want to show one, one more time this video, especially the first part. Um, you can see here the bioreactors. And also in the center, there is some bottles that contain the same media, nutrient media that makes the growth of bacteria. You can see that here, it looks just like yellow, like a very, I don't know, very concentrated tea or a very awful coffee. So this is the real color of how media looks like. And bacteria, for most of the time, doesn't change this color. But when you look at the bioreactor, this looks really awesome. Um, I think one important thing for those that, want, that are creating artworks or would like to create artworks with bacteria or curators that are presenting bacteria in the galleries is the way you present it. This looks very technological, very scientific, and even techno-elegant. Because they put, with something very simple, they put uh, orange light in the bottom to create this effect. Without this orange light, this bioreactor, it only looks like a dirty dish. Uh, however, the whole composition, I think it was outstanding. And once you enter to the room, this artwork was very, very important. Of course, it had like two years of research in order to in investigate what bacteria lives in the skin. So bioart is also a field that takes time. Life takes time. Another example, also in 2019, Irreverent Miracles on Demand by Adam Brown. So maybe you have heard about some phenomena, mostly religious phenomena, where the um, status of some icons or the walls in some churches start to cry blood or to bleed. This was considered as a miracle. Uh, and Adam Brown takes the inspiration from uh, a miracle that happened in Buffalo. I will start to show the video for a moment so you can understand uh, where the inspiration came from. They found like blood. In mid-November, a host was Did inadvertently hear, dropped on the ground at mass and a church deacon placed it in a receptacle in water to be properly disposed of later. Then on Friday- I just need to ask if you hear the audio of the video because I'm yes. not sure. Yep. Yeah. Friday, November 30th, the Eucharistic minister noticed something unusual about the host and we have the image up now. Lisa, you were among the first eyewitnesses what did you see here and what did you think and in the ablution cup was uh it was where jesus was and so i went to the rectory and i actually saw jesus at that time 
what I thought was Jesus. There was a presence there. Mm -hmm. And I instantly, when I saw him, I kneeled down to the ground and I was in awe. For centuries, the great monotheistic religions, such as Catholicism, proliferated stories about autonomous human mastery over all other organisms. Touting that man was made in God's image has blinded us to the fact that we are indeed interconnected to nature and that our histories have been influenced by non-human species. Irreverent, Miracles on Demand is an artwork that examines the impact of invisible microbial agents on the course of human history and Okay, I'm gonna stop there, uh, but you can watch the whole video in, in his portfolio. I just uh, mentioned a little bit deeper of what he did. So uh, he isolated bacteria that grow in bread, uh, basically uh, can grow in any type of bread. And what's probably the bacteria that grow in this water container container with a piece of, of bread. Um, and when the bacteria grows, it looks uh, like very red, reddish, like blood, and it starts to secrete some red liquid that looks like blood. So this kind of bacteria was growing in several of these phenomena uh, that were discovered during the last centuries. And basically he was explaining how it was working, uh, the divine phenomenon. Uh, this bacteria is called Serratia marcensis, and it produces this viscid liquid very similar to the blood. So during the exhibition, you can see the miracle happening. Uh, I think that is a very strong artwork uh, it didn't was it was not awarded with any prize during the Arts Electronica. It was only presented there. I also think that is one of the most, uh, let's say, politically incorrect artworks recently. But I think that well, personally, I love the politically incorrectness, uh, and I really like how even for uh, someone that could be quite religious this is not a proof that it was fake or something it's just a proof of how wonderful is the world if you believe uh, that someone created or not uh still how awesome how incredible the world that we live that there is this little bacteria that we don't see that can make us believe in something else uh so this is miracles on the mind by adam brown then, okay, we passed for bacteria, tissues. Uh, let's go for plants. We have the artwork here of Gilberto Esparza. It's called Photosynthetic Plants. And what you are seeing here, this impressive installation is autosufficient and autophotosynthetic organisms, the whole thing. It is basically a cyborg between life uh, microscopic life of bacteria, algae, and technology. In the large containers, there is soil and different bacteria. These bacteria uh, live in the system of soil and by, by the metabolism when they are eating, they create electricity. This electricity turns off and on it turns on the lights presented here, and the light comes into the center and nucleus center with the algae. When there is light, the algae is able to make photosynthesis and grow, keep alive. Um, and in some moment, of course, the bacteria eats all the nutrients, and there is no more light. It will mean that the, the algae will start to die because there is no way to make photosynthesis. However, there is a sensor that when there is no more photosynthesis, the algae brings back to the column biomedia, the same uh, liquid with some proteins and some pieces of algae, so the bacteria can keep eating 
generating electricity, then the electricity goes into light. The light keeps alive the algae making photosynthesis. So, so it is an autonomous synthetic organism, technological organism. Uh, Gilberto Esparza is very focused in the environmental issues of Mexico City. And this artwork was also presented in the Festival of Arts Electronica. Uh, continuing with flowers. Uh, this is one of my favorite projects. Uh, it was still uh, in research. Uh, it's called Bipolar Flower. It's one of my favorites just because I, I love the mental uh, different behaviors that exist in, in humans. And bipolarity is very interesting because it has episodes of maniac behavior when you have like a hype of serotonin and you are very excited and adrenaline and also long periods of depression. So th that's a characteristic of bipolar. There is long periods of euphoria and long periods of depression. Um, so uh, Adam Saretsky, he tried to create a bipolar flower but of course, it cannot be just adapted into what humans understand by bipolarity. So first he needed to understand how a flower lives, what is the patterns and behaviors of the flower and the plant, in this case, it was the plant Arabidopsis thaliana, to understand what it will mean for a plant to have um, mental disease you know, or a different behavioral pattern than the common from others. So all of the organisms have genes and the gene express proteins and the proteins make all the functions of the organism. So he realized that he could um, modify inserting a part of DNA that creates some proteins that al alter the expression of the normal proteins of the flower. What he inserted was genes that create proteins called zinc fingers. And the zinc fingers will mess up with the genome of the plant, with the genes of the plant. It will start to push some genes to express more. So the plant will have a lot of proteins of something that maybe she doesn't eat, sorry, it doesn't need. Um, and then the zinc fingers will push the expression of another gene and will make another type of proteins that the plant doesn't need. So it will be a war between expression of the proteins to survive and the proteins that are just expressing without sense. Uh, so it will be a push and pull of expression of genes. So the protein, pro the plant will express a lot of proteins to grow but when there is too much, there will be another genetic mechanism to push them down. So it will be a lot of ups and downs in the expression of the gene, genome of the plant. Uh, some of the characteristics is that the bipolar flower grow bigger and the leaves were much more extended than the, the leaves of uh, Arabidopsis thaliana that was not bipolar. Uh, it, the bipolar gave more flowers. Uh, you can see there is a big difference and they were in the same stage. Like they were culture in the same day, in the same conditions, in the same room, uh, from the same seats, except that this one has a modification that pulls up and down the expression of genes. And this was a result of the bipolar flower. And then Adam, um, struggled a lot to exhibit this artwork in any gallery. I think that one of the problems, maybe not nowadays, but still 10 years ago, it was how to bring a genetically modified organism into a gallery, how to bring a virus, how to bring a bacteria. Curators were not ready to present a living tissue in the gallery. Uh, so Adam uh, had a lot of problems and in one moment, he decided to make just a performance with another of his projects. He was creating an instrument chamber that was generating 
music and light. And he brought their, their bipolar flower as kind of therapy and recorded as a performance. You will see um, the uh, Adam and collaborators bringing the flowers in a container, sealed container uh, tube, because, well, as any modified organism, um, it needs to be contained in order to not contaminate other organisms and the, the modification can go out of control. And during his all projects, he likes to talk about absurdity, uh, absurdity and irony, making art in laboratories. So here it is uh, part of this performance when he brought the plants to receive a concert. So he's also talking. What you see there is the artists and scientists um, bringing the plants into a concert and that also is talking about the personhood of plants. Recently, last year, if I don't remember when we were in the pandemic, there was also a concert in Barcelona where there was no humans, there were only plants that received the, the concert of the orchestra in the big theater. So this is one of the final performance that he did. Uh, inside the laboratory, bringing plants. Okay, that, then let's talk about humans. We are also bio, we are also alive, still. So this artwork is a hell of a poetic artwork. I love it a lot. It's Marco de Menezes. Uh, he is one of the pioneers, female pioneers in bio art. And in 2019, she presented the project Anti Marta. Uh, she has been working with her husband in some moments. Her husband is a bio, uh, biochemistry, if I remember correctly. And he um, was participating sometimes or uh, helping in some moments, Marta, but he has never collaborated as such uh, in a project until this one. And they have been together, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, around 20 years or more. And this artwork is a poetic performance between the, de between the two of them. Uh, when we are in a long relationship, sometimes there is this kind of symbiosis and connections. Uh, and sometimes it can be easy to confuse who we are without the partner that we have been together so much, so much time. So Martha decided to make a performance with her husband that gives back to her the individuality and her identity. So you see here two circles. Basically, these two circles were uh, fragments of her skin that they were cut. And in the arm of Luis, her husband, they are the same two circles. Uh, this came from a study that was in USA when, we, when scientists were studying the tissue transplantation. Sometimes they were using their own bodies to understand how the skin can be transplanted. Nowadays, if you have a very bad burn, for example, in a fire accident, and your, your face gets burned, they can take your own skin from your leg and put it in your face in order to recover your, your born skin. 
So what, what scientists were doing before, uh, in the 50s in USA, they were cutting these two circles of their own skin and put it one here and put it the other in the, bottom, in the top part. So basically, if everything was good and no contamination, your own skin will receive and adapt to your own skin. You might have the, the scars, but there was a proof that they could be a skin transplantation. So Marta and Luis made uh, something similar. However, imagine that there is the other arm of Luis and he also had the two dots. Marta took he, her fragment of this part of her skin and put it down. The same Luis from the bottom to down. But the second fragment from here they inserted it in the top of Luis and the second fragment of Luis inserted it in the top of Martha. So there was a piece of Luis here and a piece of Martha here in the arm of Martha. Her own body will recognize her own skin and integrate it and make a cicatrization. But the skin of Luis will be rejected because it has different DNA and different antibodies. So it will be rejected, dried, and in some moment it will fall. This is the idea of how they can still be together, but also not being able to overcome their biological limits. For me, this is an artwork, very romantic, in my, own, my personal perception, but of course it's very sensitive and intimate. And I think one of the beautiful parts of artists working with their own bodies that they create themselves as artworks. So they establish that it will be rejected by nature, irrationality, unifies uh, science, and it will connect with the artistic statement of what life uh, and individuals mean to each other. Okay, other bodies. How um, bio, your own body as a bio can interact with technologies. This is mostly an example of technological art, but it is also related with your own body, that it can be part of bio art. The artist Moon Rivas, uh, she's from Barcelona, she inserted in her foot a sensor and a chip that was connected to the database of earthquakes in, in the world. So everything that the, every time that there was an earthquake uh, in some part of the world, there was a vibration in her feet. So she felt every time there was a movement of the earth and she was creating choreographies uh, with these movements that, they, that she was sensing. Um, it's, Let's not say that it's a simple artwork because it is um, very complicated to insert a chip in your own skin. But let's say there is a very um, a stylish and very direct piece that is extremely powerful because feeling the sensor vibrating in your foot is not only meaning that there is a movement in the air that you are part of, but also the social effects that it will have. Usually when there is an earthquake, well, a lot of buildings will fall. There is a lot of destruction and sometimes, well, most of the times, a lot of death. So the responsibility of the artist, it, it was not only feeling the movement of the earth, but she was move, feeling the movement of the whole planet, including animals, plants, and humans. They had to remove recently, last year, they had to remove the sensor uh, and the performance uh, finished. However, well, she will always have the scar that will remind the connection between all the living systems. We have Pei Ying Ling uh, with the project Small Fox Syndrome that becomes very popular after the vaccination now with coronavirus. Uh, you see these little scars she proposes that vaccines can be something aesthetical, aesthetic. So 
the vaccine marks can leave uh, some pattern to create an aesthetic uh, uh, pattern that indicates that you are vaccinated. So in a world where we hypothetically could be uh, attacked by different uh, viruses or bacteria that, that I need to say is not the story about bioart. The story of bioart is the collaborations with other microorganisms, for example, without viruses, uh, humans probably won't survive. If all the viruses disappear today, humans will disappear tomorrow because viruses are an important agent for the control, control of the environment and killing bacteria. Otherwise, bacteria will kill us probably. Um, we have the ability to bear children because uh, a virus uh, helps with a mechanism to modify our genome and humans and other animals can bear children in their bellies. Also, viruses uh, make possible of this genetically modification of organisms. So uh, coming back to the importance of vaccines, she presents a utopian world where the mark can, of a vaccine can be aesthetically appreciated and she proposes these ideas. Beijing also has working with the idea of viruses, uh, like eating viruses, uh, they, uh, understanding the viruses are all over the world. So when you are eating specific vegetables, you are eating also specific viruses that are not pathogenic for humans, but they are mostly in these vegetables. Uh, another type of collaboration with insects. Uh, we have Hubert Duprant, he's working with the, this larva. Uh, the larval larva catfish, naturally, the larva lives in the water and it creates also um, some silk that is very sticky. And it sticks to its own body, different stones or dirt from where it lives. Usually they are stones, rocks, but the artist took the caddiefish fly, cad, sorry, caddis fly uh, larvae and put it in an environment with gold and pearls. So this little lar larva uh, made its own, um, its own home uh, by gold. And then when the larva goes away, the artist can have these little cocoons and sell it as pieces of artworks in collaboration with the, with the insect made of gold and pearls. And then let's go to the ecosystems. Um, this installation that you are seeing here uh, is connected, well, uh, is co connecting different uh, aqua systems and in this little um, visualizers there is holographic videos that's how the installation looks like but what is what is the topic so the artist is um, Robertina and she has been working with ecosystems like uh, the oceans and water uh, this artwork is called, called Aqua Forensics. And it is talking about the effect of human industry uh, in the Anthropoc Anthropocene, that is uh, the period when humans have been affecting the, uh, the ecosystem and the earth, is the effect of the anthropogenic um, style of life into the ecosystems like the oceans. For example, by the chemical substance that we throw into the water, the re residues of human consumptions of medicines. For example, the antidepressants, uh, when they go into the water system, uh, they go in very small quantities. Most of the drugs that we take when we are ill, well, they get absorbed by humans. Uh, by our system, but some some small quantities just go outside of our organism, 
and then they will go to the disposal of uh, dark waters and some of them arrive to the seas and different lakes. So these residues can also affect the um, ecosystem like the fish and the algae. So she was analyzing how the pharmaceutical industry is changing the ecosystem in the water. Um, so in these little uh, holographic videos, you could see um, the in vitro experiments of these organisms in the water, how they react to a 20,000 times weaker solution of some drugs from the pharmaceuticals and how they will die because of this. So it was showing the impact that we have in the water ecosystems in the micro and the macro levels. Okay, uh, I could really talk about bio art for hours and hours, but I will try to go faster and just give you they may be the final example. Uh, in bio art, they will be creative and there is a slight they might not connection with a lot of other types of uh, art. The artistic values of the outcomes of this process are like like still in the eyes of the beholder. The may questions may regarding the possibilities is an example are of bio art. What will happen when Where such a system starts to express qualities that are considered uniquely human they are attitudes such as art? But they are drawing what a brain the art's identity extends beyond our cultural comprehension of living systems. Align, made from living a layer matter, of cells from the brain of a rat is telling it to draw. Electronics simultaneously the viewer's perception of the concept of sentience. These robot arms are the where the ability to sense the outside world through a camera and the that acts as its eyes. Of the rat was it in has a the ability to process what it sees through the neurons that act as its eyes. The brain, uh, the, the, the cells of the brain through the robotic were connected to sensors, electrical body. sensors, to a camera. The internet then functions the as an extended nervous system. And the camera was watching some person, some portrait. So the camera is watching Within Dr. Steve Pollard's lab at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, a living neural cultures. Pixels. He's applying different the technologies to study dissociated cultures of tens of thousands of million neurons. The neurons receiving the electrical impulses by the camera. And by internet, the, is performing the, relationships the brain the stimulation to the uh, neural or the neurons and the resulting drawings are observed. Robotic arms this phase of Miart is known as the to draw. The, a webcam captures images the of viewers within the gallery of the space. In so, These images are then converted into a stimulation map um, used to stimulate the neurons. But it's possible, this is know, the beginning of the drawing process. This was already more than 10 years ago. A multi-channel so, recording from uh, the neural I'm, culture I'm really is performed in Potter's lab. This will capture the neural activity that results from stimulations. The resulting data is then processed in two locations. Uh, and these artworks the outcome converted to movement. Moreover, that is technologically awesome, makes very the art operates in a manner similar to the way in which an artist draws. In that the artist art. is constantly looking at the and drawing one of the question on the paper is, and comparing it to the, the original here? subject. In so, the art, the progression the of the drawing is monitored and compared with the original this. image. But the difference between the two is the that sent back to the lab the one as another stimulation map to complete the feedback. But the, the rat is also the one that is creating the symbiotic a research cognitive, primitive cognitive process to understand by a camera like an, like an eye, external eye. Uh, and I have been in a very funny lecture when they were saying that this was a rat artist. The artist was a rat or a robotic rat artist. Uh, of course, in the world of humans, well, the artist and the recognized artist is Guy Ben Ari, but it also makes the questions of what means to be an artist. So, this whole system, an eye, a few neurons, and the robotic arm, is creating art that it has been self. This project was in Moscow. Uh, and the camera was watching the black square of Malevich and creating different representations of the black square. And these artworks have been sold, uh, very highly priced, and some of them still remain in Moscow. Okay, uh, so 
This is one of the most famous uh, projects of bioart. When Eduardo Katz create the glowing bunny called Alva, they put the green fluorescent protein in the genome of the um, bunny and it make it glow. This is a technology that is, it has been used in science for a lot of years, but it was never used just for aesthetics. Here you see the rabbit glowing well, like completely, even the eye. There is some speculation that this artwork didn't exist or it didn't look like this. So if you ask me, I really don't care if it really existed or not. Uh, he presented it and he already put the idea of this genetically modified glowing rabbit in our heads. And that's itself already an artwork to present um, a fairy tale or a possibility of genetic organisms and creating new organisms. But people was very scared uh, about this little rabbit glowing because it looked like a monster. And he also created another piece modifying the plant in this petunia that he called Edunia, that is the combination of his name Eduardo and Petunia, Edunia. Edunia expressed the hemoglobin from Eduardo. So they took the gene from the artist, inserted into the plant, and these red veins have part of the artist's uh, genome. So there is hemoglobin that it has, uh, that gives this red tissue. So of course, again, people was like, some people was very fascinated, other people love it, was very inspirational. But from some other, it was very scary to think that there was like a bloody flower or a glowing rabbit. Uh, but I, I think that Eduardo made a very nice way to change your perspective in one of his talks. So now I'm gonna share with you uh, the activity that he does. He asked people to put their hands like a little bit together. You can put in your arm, like one centimeter from far from your skin. And when you put your hands close to each other or touch your, uh, put your skin uh, like five millimeters far, you will start to feel some heat. And this heat is usually uh, like your temperature, but also the heat comes from the infrared light that uh, you have in your skin. And humans cannot see infrared. However, other organisms like reptiles uh, can see infrared. So they look at us like these glowing monsters. So for them, we're also glowing monsters as it was the little bunny, right? So this is um, a change of perspective that when we're talking about the life of others, of plants and bacteria, it is not necessary, it's, it's not only to describe them from a human perspective, but try to cheat or thought uh, of how, what life means to other species. So um, I hope that now that you know that you are glowing, you can also see other species with my, your bigger empathy. Um, and if you know that you are glowing, sometimes you are very sad in the morning, you just remember that you are shining and maybe your day will become a little bit better. Okay, so what is the difference between having a bunch of bacteria and fungus in your fridge than having a bunch of bacteria in the gallery? Well, as I told in the very beginning, the idea that is behind of your artwork. Uh, Melissa Fisher grows sculptures of herself with nutrient media that looks like gelatin that has a lot of nutrients for bacteria. Then she took the bacteria from her uh, skin, from her face and culture it over these sculptures of herself. Okay, and what is the idea behind? I told you that you are uh, like half percent bacteria, half percent human. So she was talking of who I am, the microbial me. There is thousands and millions of bacteria that is affecting my skin, my behavior that is helping me to digest uh, what I eat. So this is another part of me. That's why the artwork is called microbial me. Um, so I also hope that, well, first I hope you don't have bacteria and fungus growing in your fridge, but if you have, well, maybe you will see it different. 
<laughs> Here is the time lapse of how the fungi and bacteria are growing. Okay, um, I will go very fast for this last part. Uh, there are different ways to collaborate to, to create bioart. First, you can do it in your kitchen. Uh, you can do it as an artist investigating about science. You can do it as a scientist investigating about art. You can make groups. Uh, you can invite your sci the scientists into your studio or the, or the artists can go into the labs. One of my favorites is going to the lab. Uh, and <laughs> this is the research that I was inspired to make one of my last projects. They, the scientists were removing the cells from different tissues. In the lab, you have the heart of a chicken. And the heart of a chicken is, it is made well of cardiac, cardiac cells, but it also has a structure of something similar like cartilage or cellulose. So when you break all the cells, the structure remains. And the same happens with the leaves in the plants. You can break all the cells and they will fall apart of the structure, but the structure is made of cellulose that is a protein. So this is only an em empty structure. How they, why they start to do this? Well, because uh, the spinach leaf, for example, it has a lot of venation, these little veins, uh, and they are investigating the um, movement of drugs inside veins, uh, for example, to put some drugs or medicaments in uh, some drugs or medicines, sorry, uh, into the systems of veins of humans. But also, it is possible that when you have an empty structure of cellulose, you can put back uh, different type of cells. For example, you have the leaf, then you will remove the cells from the leaf. How you do this with a very strong detergent and also passing uh, uh, this detergent by the system of the veins. And once it is completely empty, you can put back cells from, for example, muscular cells or cells from your skin, from your epidermis, and they will grow around this structure. So when I read that, I was like fascinated. It was uh, very amazed for me to create an image of a meat leaf uh, that I could put my own cells into a, a plant or into a flower. So I started experimenting uh, with different flowers, even the whole flower, uh, I achieved to decellularize some roses and some tulips. Uh, here you can see an example of removing all the cells. Of course, um, well, the whole three-dimensional object might be difficult to grow completely cells around it because it's multi-layer. That's why it will be better to think in a layer a structure like the leaf. So if we can grow cells here, and it has a system of veins, it gives me the possibility to think about transplants or implants in this case, uh, where the structure can be inserted in your skin, connected to your uh, circular system so you won't die, and you can put, back, put your own cells so there will be no rejection for your system. This is a speculative idea and speculative project that was presented as an installation. Uh, to insert something in your skin is a long process. I, the artists that I mentioned, like Marta or uh, the chief from Moon Rivas, well, they, those are was required works and a lot of specialists like doctors, psychiatrists that will be with you during the whole process. Uh, so therefore I presented this speculative a studio workshop where you can go and decellularize your plant and, and there will be some pictures of how it can be inserted in, in, your, in your skin, how you could get this uh, transplant tattoo into your skin. 
Um, the artwork is also a ritual. Is uh, after you get the transplant into your skin, there are some change in your behavior that you need to implement. For example, now you need to expose your skin more often to the sun. Uh, you need to make some exercise of plant meditation. You need to remain still as plants. Uh, so here I'm trying to integrate the idea of becoming something else. So when we remove the cells of the plant, or for example here, the flower, a lot of people still see the flower. But there is no a flower anymore. There is not a living system. It's just the shape. So it made me think in how we give attributes to the shapes. So it looks like a flower. So for us, it's a flower. But it's actually not a flower anymore. So something that looks like human, but is not human. What happens if I inserted a vegetal shape into my human self? It the artwork tells about the malleability of the self body, the capacity to change or form and do not just attribute um, qualities to an organism just by the shape, by, by challenging how our body can change. And nevertheless, becoming something else is not only about the shape, becoming a glowing rabbit, becoming a um, bloody flower, becoming a bipolar uh, flower is a combination of human and other entity. So becoming with is not only the shape and the resembles, but the change also in creating something new. That's why once you get the transplant, you need to have different behavior. Uh, in the Art and Science Center, we created this other artwork work, working with uh, spiders. And it was in the laboratories of ITMO, they are uh, magnetic silk. They are modifying silk in order to make it magnetic. So we have the spiders here and you can insert the nanoparticles, ferromagnetic, magnetic, ferromagnetic nanoparticles and you will have magnetic silk from the spider. So our students created this piece uh, where they talk about also living labor. So the scientists are looking at these spiders and spider silk as something that can be beneficial, like a biosensor for drugs or delivery or medicine delivery. But the artists in the students were thinking about how this technology could be used by the spider itself. So they came up with the idea of concentration of power, technological power, and designed this sphere as, uh, as a concentration of this power and technology. And when you approach to the sphere, uh, there you could appreciate the movement. The sphere is made by magnetic silk, so it reacts to magnets. Inside of the sphere, there were magnets moving. Uh, well, most of the observers in the beginning didn't know. So when you approach, you only see like this creepy, silky uh, sphere moving that looks like a complete living organism breathing. Uh, it was quite scary, but fun to see the reaction of a lot of people. And uh, well, the video cannot, doesn't look very good. But you can visit it in our social media. I'm pretty sure we have some videos there about this art. OK, so to finishing our meeting, I want to give you a homework. Uh, it's not necessary to uh, put down, uh, right, to write down right now. It will be also in the description of the video that you can visit later in the YouTube channel, uh, just to have some fun. Um, a lot of the bio art projects born in big laboratories, but in the 20 years uh, after the big bomb, boom, the bio art has also migrated to kitchens, to garage, and to the community. So the do-it-yourself community is also uh, working with the knowledge of biotechnologies, DNA modification, plants, perception um, from their home. So there is a very simple experiment you can do if you're at your home to see your DNA. Um, it's not a pure DNA, it's not a pure extraction, 
uh, what you will extract will be a combination of DNA, RNA, and some small proteins. But uh, I think it's very interesting to realize that, yeah, indeed, DNA exists and is in you and you come from it. So the very first thing you need to do is to take some water with salt, like half of the glass with one, one teaspoon of uh, salt will be enough. And you need to gargle uh, with it. So pass it through your mouth, try to put it in your cheeks. So this will take cells from your mouth your own cells, and then you split it into a crystal glass. If you have like a small glass that is a little bit tall, like the one you use for vodka or something like that, uh, for shots, and then you split it there and put half spoon of liquid dishwasher. Uh, in Russia, uh, like fairy, it's okay. And let it dress, mix it, stir for a moment and let it rest 10 minutes. What you are doing with this salt and dishwasher is breaking your cells. So the membrane of your cells will be broken and the membrane that contains the DNA will be also broken. Uh, after these 10 minutes that everything broke and there is a mixture of protein DNA and broken cells, you need to pour uh, ethanol uh, sometimes it's difficult to get ethanol, but you can have any strong spirit or even vodka or gin can work, but it should be cold ice. So leave it like 30 minutes before in the fridge. So it should be super cold. And you pour it in the, by the side, so the mixture do not mix with the ethanol. It just drops here, the ethanol. And it won't it will be a separation between your mix of cells and the ethanol. And slowly, a white um, semi-transparent blob of DNA will come into your ethanol. And this is DNA, your own DNA, and maybe DNA or bacteria that lives in your mouth, uh, but mostly your DNA and RNA. So, I will leave to Lina the instructions that will be later in the video and also for the premaster, we can send it um, personally. And if you take, if you decide to make this at home, and, and I will be happy if you can send us a picture and tag us and, and see how your DNA looks like. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I hope it was interesting for you. Um, as I say, I can talk and talk about bio art and I already exceeded my limits, but thank you for your patience. And um, I just want to say that for me, bio art is a journey of empathy towards everything that is alive and not alive in this world uh, and the different conformations. So uh, for me, it's fascinating to understand how the biology and chemistry, all the atoms are connected and influenced in this conformation. So there is no new matter from the beginning of the Big Bang, for example. So nothing has been created or destroyed, only transformed. So the proteins that are made of carbon and oxygen in my body, probably hundreds of years ago, not hundreds, like thousands of years ago, were part of a plant, right? In the morning, I ate uh, some a eggs with bacon, and now the proteins of the eggs and the bacon are in my body creating the energy that I'm using to talk to you. So I'm also part egg and bacon. And this egg was part of the chicken. So to unveil all of this connection, I think is one of the main motivations for me to study bio art and if you would like also to go into this crazy world I will be happy to see you here soon in in the art and science center this is my instagram and the email so thank you for your attention and I will be very happy to hear questions and so you can turn on your microphone or write it in the chat Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Do you still have this leaf uh, in your hand? No. Was it, was uh, it your <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, actually it was not my hand. Uh, the one that I showed you was not my hand. But um, the leaf was never inserted. It, it is a project that requires like much more time to really make a theoretical uh, insertion. I hope I could do it someday. Uh, but for now, it was just a speculation. It looks real. I need to say, I didn't use Photoshop, so that was good. It really looks uh, kind of inserted because it was transparent. So when you put it in your skin, it really gives a sensation that is inside. Oh, I guys, see I see that. <laughs> Sorry. I see that you growed in the chat, but uh, I, I didn't see <laughs> the the chat before sorry if, if i miss let me look but yeah i can hear questions <laughs> uh hello maybe i missed the beginning of the talk uh but i would like to ask you was there initially some project that sparked your interest in this particular field mm -hmm. the initial project huh well, when I was in Mexico, I'm talking about like 10 years ago, it was Alba, the bunny. It was the first project that I saw, I think because it was the most popular. And, and I was amazed that um, something that I have seen before in the labs could become an artwork. And in my, and looking for what makes an artwork an artwork instead of an object in the laboratory, uh, inspire me to learn more, but um, I think one of the artworks that get me fascinated, let me try to share also my screen, uh, maybe it's more recent artwork, but it's by Joe Davis, it's called um, Bombix Chrysopeia, and he makes a workshop uh, with this project. This is Joe Davis. And ah, look, I'm here. <laughs> uh, here is um, Golden Silk. So he modified the um, silk worm to express a protein from a marine sponge. And this protein from the marine sponge can take different metals from the environment. So the silk that the worm uh, did uh, could take gold for the solution. So the final artwork was this golden silk. It's a principle of alchemy to transform anything into gold. And also it's a fairy tale from Rob, Rob Wenstilski uh, of the golden silk. So the idea of creating a fairy tale come true and al something as ancient as alchemy to reality, I think that is, is one of my main inspiration. I'm very interested to combine magic with science because they are quite opposite. So I, I, I really like the idea to combine things that in the surface might not be related, but you can find some connections. Yeah, I think this this artwork is some some one of my favorites and that inspired me a lot. Yeah, it's really very poetic. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe the second thing I wanted to ask uh, is about like uh, which aspect is more important to you, uh, research aspect or aesthetic aspect? Um. Well. Uh, in general, in general, I think for bioart, both of them should be um, a good research will give you the ability to defend uh, the position better. Uh, let's say I think aesthetically might be slightly more more important. Uh, because if if, if you cannot present it well, uh, it's, 
it doesn't express what you want to express um, in, in the artwork itself, it will just keep in shadows. And for me personally, because I struggle the most with the aesthetical part, that becomes the most important for me. Um, so I think like my previous experience gave me uh, a, a bit of skills of how to make the research, but uh, the aesthetical part, I was still working on, I still will grow. So I, I think well, every artist should keep growing. But I think that for me is the most important part personally, just because I struggle the most with it. There are great artworks that have a strong research, but they are not presented well. They keep in the shadows. Um, there are some artworks that they look fantastic, but the research is very weak. Anywhere they are quite popular. But that's a question of popularity. If I'm talking about a good bio art project, the radio should be almost the same. Thank you. Maybe, uh, sorry, uh, maybe none of it is really the most important. Maybe the most important thing is the idea, or maybe some metaphorical, metaphorical um, expression and uh, research itself and uh, aesthetics could be, um, correct me if I'm wrong, could be somehow like in instruments to, to say that. True. I think if you don't have a strong concept, well, everything could fall. So from the basis could be the concept. Um, yeah, so, so sometimes it's very funny with art uh, because, yeah, the artist could give the same the, the interpretation, then the curator can also modify, and then the observer will understand whatever the observer wants. Um, but in order that you person you personally feel comfortable and, and nice with your work, the concept should be the first thing that you should work on. Yeah, and it's I think it's right, not even from the artist's perspective, but as you said, from creators and from observers' perspective, uh, the concept also is, uh, from my point of view, the main thing. And somehow I think that even uh, research uh, could be differently uh, understood by, for example, an artist and an observer. True. True. Right, you are. Yeah, I think uh, you mentioned something very beautiful, like uh, that research and aesthetics are like the tools to came to life your, your concept. So yeah, the concept, uh, I think, at least in contemporary art, is the base. Any other comments, projects? What do you think? Did it change your perspective about um, bio art? Not really, it's still a little creepy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand. <laughs> it sort of didn't change it created the whole new perspective and it's really mind-boggling and i think we'll have to process it for a bit <laughs> yes and it's, it's a huge field that, that's why um uh i also try to go like from the micro to the macro but there is so many ways to, to explore the life itself The basic message that I got from it that like we are all connected. Well, I, I love to hear that, that then. <laughs> then my mission was accomplished. <laughs> Thank you very much for this. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other comment, question? So you are, who is here preparing for the, uh, from in the pre-masters for exam? Do you have any questions about the, the master, the process?
Hey. Hey, Laura. Um, I was fascinated with your presentation. I really like it. Um, I wish I could they like blossom with those plants inside my skin. That's not so creepy. Maybe other shapes and stuff. Yeah, it's still weird, but um, like embracing our connection with nature, I think is pretty beautiful and and, and important. And uh, regarding the questions about the master, the, the master, I uh, like to ask you. Uh, what is the process or what kind of facilities do we have available for students? Uh, for example, well, I'm not, yeah, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm really curious about labs. Like I really like labs. My mom is a microbiologist, but I barely had the chance to like experiment with those things because it was just her work. But yeah, I'm really interested to to see how uh, other artists um, develop their projects and yeah, that kind of stuff. Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so, first of all, um, for make your career in science art or in bio art, it's not necessary to have a background in science. Um, my group was uh, super heterogeneous, like we have engineers, we have fine artists, we have um, gas and oil uh, students that came into art and now they are curators and also doing bio art. So the master program tries to give you all the basic uh, tools to develop your career as an artist, as a curator. Um, uh, in any of the categories that you like, if there is digital art, or in, you, if you don't know anything about coding or modeling, the master will give you. The same will happen with bio art. Um, in the very beginning, there now we plan to make an introduction uh, for the labs, uh, so the students can go to all of the labs uh, re regarding. Uh, in connection with the masters. So you will go to robotics lab to visit them, to see what projects are there, to chemistry, to bio, to digital, and have a little tour. Uh, then you also have during the whole master, a program, a, a section called studios. And in the studios, um, you also have like advisor and they bring you sometimes to the lab to make experiments and starts from the very basic. For example, in the first course of bio art that you will have, you will have like an intro from artworks, but also a bit of biology, the necessary to know how to work in the lab. So we will teach you like how to hold uh, this instrument, where to put it, uh, that you need to wear gloves all the time. So it, it is a journey where you will be always uh, with the help of, of the supervisor or the teacher. And it's open for all the, the levels of entrance from very basic people that have never been in the lab or people that sometimes have been or even um, <coughs> experienced. So the thing is that if there is experience, these people also can help to bring up their partners to the same level. So the art and science community is something still small even in the world. So it's very friendly and we are always trying to teach each other uh, different skills. And so in, in my experience, uh, I saw my classmates grow into the very high level of working in the lab. And I also learned to work with computers or digital that I have never done before. So it, it is like a boost because there is uh, different disciplines in the master. And well, ITMO has, well, I, I don't want to lie, but there is like a lot of laboratories, <laughs> technological, uh, digital, and in bio, like there is for food, there is bioprinting, there is uh, with insects, uh, with genetical modification, with tissue culturing, um, nanomaterials, uh, then, uh, well, my colleagues later would tell you more about the digital and technological art, but 
the advantage of the master for me was the, the that is inside a technological institute. So there was a lot of labs, a lot of important research, and you can go there and make collaborations. So it really are they are really open to to create something together. That was my experience. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I would like to ask you something else. I also asked Ethan about this. Um, I would like to know how do you feel like as a native uh, Spanish speaker <laughs> uh, with dealing with Russian uh, people and also um, if the prime masters offer the masters offers um, a Russian course like yeah that thing mm -hmm. okay um so <laughs> i'm gonna be very honest uh when i came to russia i came to moscow and uh if russians here will understand that moscow and st petersburg are completely different and in moscow had a very rapid fast life and for me it was a little bit difficult even to get motivated to learn the language because uh, everything was very fast, very like very serious. And I came just from Mexico, like super happy, smiling to everyone. <laughs> and and it was a little bit hard my beginning in Russia, but in Moscow. And I really didn't think that I would stay. But then I met St. Petersburg, and St. Petersburg just felt like home. Um, there is. Uh, a lot of warm environment. There is a lot of international communities. Um, the majority of my friends and colleagues here are uh, Russians, and all of them also speak English. And now I felt the motivation to, to learn uh, Russian. It's not difficult to live without knowing Russian. Russian is difficult, but uh, most of the time, everyone will help you. They know some words in, in English. Uh, even in Spanish, uh, I have found people, and every time that I say that I'm uh, from a Latin American country, everyone is welcoming me, and they are very happy to receive origins. And uh, I think I cannot speak for other cities. Like Russia is huge, uh, uh, but St. Petersburg make make me feel like like at home. During the master. Um, I didn't receive Russian classes as such, but like inside the, um, the master program, but you can attend Russian lessons. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe now they will be included in the master, you, I need to ask uh, the coordinator. However, you can always visit the Russian lessons that are made for bachelor and and you will learn. So th there is the option that you can go to, to Russian lessons. And yeah, like I need to say, that it means like I speak very bad Russian. <laughs> um, and even when it's very bad, um, I I can do everything by myself. And, and I know the basics and you can learn the basics in two weeks and I will be very, very good. And Russians, we always try to teach you good stuff and bad words. So you will learn soon. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> so, any other question, guys? I will be happy to see if someone of you try to, to extract your own DNA. Uh, I, I, I want to know, um, so is here, everyone is from the premasters in the, in the chat, yeah? So l just, uh, I want to know, like, um, what are you doing? What, what are you studying or, or why are you interested in art? Just let me like two sentences, like, ah, oh, um, Vanessa, I'm studying design, I don't know. <laughs> well, 
Well, I'm a content marketer in tech, but I'm also a writer and I wanted to, uh, you know, explore storytelling uh, opportunities, maybe in virtual reality or in some interactive, uh, I, I don't know, some interactive fields and mediums. So something like that. Awesome. That's really cool. <laughs> Looking forward to see you. Melissa, where are you from? I'm from Colombia. Um, I study sociology and political science. I'm finishing also music. And I'm currently working in research. And like, um, it's a really broad field, like um, technology, virtual reality. But it's just like um, a really theoretical work. I haven't been able to uh, make practice because, you know, like uh, new technologies are really expensive and funding is really complicated when you live in Latin America. But yeah, I'm looking forward to, you know, uh, learn new stuff in the master. I think it's really, it's really, yeah, it really goes along with my, my interests. And yeah, yeah, I'm really glad I found this master. Okay, awesome. <laughs> very, very nice. Is any by like anyone interested in bio or biology or in the group? Well, I haven't been before I heard you. <clears throat> now I am sort of, but I'm as far <laughs> from biology as possible. I'm a linguist. Um, ah, cool. <laughs> yeah, I have been teaching English as well as science communication, but I've always been interested in all sorts of arts. I started when I was a child as a dancer, and then I moved on to musical instruments, play the piano, uh, also write some poetry in English. So, well, whatever art you throw at me, I'm interested. <laughs> I'm sort of a I don't know, art junkie, I would call myself. <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, oh, I'm um, really becoming interested in biology as well. As uh, I can see vividly how it works itself into art nowadays. So it wasn't possible, like, I don't know how many, 10, 20 years ago. It's relatively new field. Mm -hmm. yeah. It becomes more popular. <laughs> yeah, sorry. And I have a question about English uh, because uh, <laughs> um, it it says that uh, you should have B two, yeah, to enter mm -hmm. this program. But the question is, how would it be examined? Because maybe you should have a certificate like Cambridge certificate or. Oh, how and by the way i'm uh, i'm uh, uh, i'm studying um, photo and video in siberia in uh, institute of culture wow that's awesome um so for you don't need certificate for your applications um how will it will be evaluated we will have a call so um in any of the modalities for acceptance of the master, like portfolio or um, uh, exam and so on. There is a moment when you talk with the creators of the program and we just like probably ask you like, why are you interested? Um, what do you like to learn? Just to know each other better. And in this talk, well, uh, it will be in English. Uh, if you are already here in the premasters and you are hearing uh, Lina and Ethan and I speaking English, so if you understand, it, it is for sure that you can enter to the master. So don't worry. <laughs> Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was gonna answer to the previous question then. Added. I think it's safe to say that everyone will definitely, you know, come to the biolabs out of curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> it will be very entertaining. <laughs> oh.
Okay, guys. Um, if there is no more uh, comments or uh, contributions, I want to say one more time, thank you for your time and that I wish to see you soon. I think we will have a meeting on Friday. Uh, so I, you will have another premaster, so probably I will jump in there. So hope to see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.